So I've been freelancing for about a year now and I've learned a few lessons that I kind of wish I knew before because it would have saved me a lot of time. It would have made me a lot more money. So in this video, I want to be going through some of the lessons I've learned while freelancing in data analytics and share them with you so you don't have to make the same mistakes like me. For those of you who are new here, my name is Rohan. I've been in data science and analytics for the past couple of years now. Started off as a data analyst, moved to business intelligence on Wall Street, and then found their product data scientist at a tech company. From there, I made the best decision of my life to become a freelancer, mainly for the location and time freedom. I didn't want someone to like tell me to wake up at 8 a.m. on a Monday when it's raining outside and take the metro to work. I just wasn't for me. I did that for years and it just, I just couldn't go back to that lifestyle. So this is why I actually wanted to become a freelancer. I actually have a checklist down below if you want to see what it takes to be a freelancer. So go ahead and check that out. If you want to find a community of people all into data science and analytics, go ahead and join the Discord link below. Over 4,000 people in it. So the first lesson I wish I knew was always under promise and over deliver. What do I mean by this? So I have a lot of consulting friends and they always told me this while going into this. I've never done consulting. I've never done freelancing prior to a year ago. So I'm still relatively new to this. So I'm so used to work just promising as much as I can do, working as hard as I can. And your boss knows you and treats you like a human, hopefully if they're the right firm. And I never really had an issue. They always used to give me appropriate breaks in between projects. And it was pretty chill. Freelancing and contracting, consulting, whatever is a completely different ball game. They will try to lowball you as much as they possibly can in terms of pay and expect the absolute most out of it because capitalism, right? I mean, think about it from their perspective, it makes sense, right? They have a tight budget and they want to get an X amount of work done. So they're going to have to use you as much as possible. In addition to this, the turnover rate for a bunch of contractors and freelancers is very high. So for them, they're like, oh, this person's going to leave in a couple months anyways. Why do we want to make them happy? But if it's like a boss at a nine to five at a company, they're like, I want you to stay for a leadership role. So I'm going to treat you with respect. So you just don't get that. At the end of the day, you're just a glorified service provider and you're not treated like an employee if you were just working a nine to five. So an example is if you think taking that dashboard is gonna take you a month, tell them it'll take two months and then take your time. But the mistake I made is I went into that first job, I over promised like crazy, I was like, I can get this done in two weeks. And I would get the dashboard done in two weeks, I'd make it pretty lackluster just to meet the timeline. And you know what I get rewarded with right after finishing it? another project and I had to maintain those same timeline expectations. So you can see how this kind of snowballs into just burnout very, very quickly. So you have to be very careful with managing your expectations beforehand. Okay, the next thing I wish I knew is always communicate properly. Look, I don't know how you're gonna communicate with your clients. I prefer to communicate with my clients on Slack or maybe even email, but you always wanna have that open line of communication where you're giving them status reports every single week. So let's say for the last part, we're talking about the dashboard and a month is about to come by and you promise them a month and they reach out to you and they're like, where is it? But in your defense, you didn't have the data and they didn't provide it for you. So this could have been fixed with just communication, letting them know you don't have the data. And it sounds simple in theory, but generally the more you're able to communicate, the better experience you're gonna have with your clients. And I know this because I even hire different contractors like marketing agencies of my own for my companies. And the number one thing I look for is communication. Provide me a detailed report of what you did last week, what you're gonna do this week, and I'll be happy and I'll leave you alone so we don't have to waste time on meetings. So I try to carry this forward with my clients in my consulting agency and I recommend you guys do the same as well. Communicate as much as possible. The next principle I learned is cost will always be more than you expect. So I recently started traveling, I have location freedom now. And one of the things I've learned is that you need to budget more than you possibly think you need. This could be either an unexpected software expense. This could be a VPN you have to get because you can't access your client's database because you move different IP addresses. So you see how these little things add up. So oftentimes you want to always quote the client a little bit extra or ask for reimbursement while you're going through these projects because it's very rare you'll have an accurate depiction of what the cost is going to be, whether it be time-wise and whether it be monetary wise. Okay, principle number four, always charge what you're worth. I made this mistake undercharging at the beginning just to get my first few clients. And this is the most common mistake. You've applied to 50 different contracting gigs. You've sent out thousands of cold emails and you have not a single client. You might be tempted. What is one of the levers I have? My cost. You charge your cost very low, less than what you'd make in a nine to five and you get the job and then you're not happy and your self-esteem goes down. This is what happened to me. This happens to everyone. It's a beginner's mistake. But oftentimes you just want to drop your first client if you're charging a lot lower because it's just not worth it. It's a big hit on your self-esteem if you're charging a lot less than what you think you're worth. Generally, I like to price things high and then provide the best value possible. Very hard psychologically to put things very low 
and give forth your best effort. So this will just prevent your client being mad at you and you being mad at your client and just feeling like everything's unfair. Generally, rule of thumb is take your hourly at your nine to five before to get a data science or analytics role and charge 30% more because it's hourly, they don't have to pay you benefits and they can just get rid of you and you can get rid of the contract at any point in time. So always charge 30% more than what you're making hourly and just don't go under that. I know it's tempting, but just avoid it. Trust me, it'll save you so much headache and conflict later on. I also want to add that perceived value is a thing. So if you're charging like $30 an hour for data science work, they're going to think, oh, you're not experienced. You're not good at what you do. But if you charge $130 an hour, they might think, oh, wow, this guy's an expert. I want to hire him. Obviously, there, there's some like anomaly cases, but generally perceived value is a thing. So you want to price yourself accordingly. Okay, so the next step I learned is have an airtight contract and be very clear on what the services are gonna provide and what they need to pay extra for if they want it. So let's say you're only providing BI solutions, whether this be dashboarding or reporting. And one day they're like, hey, I want this machine learning model done for this other stakeholder that we have. And you might just be like, oh, they already paid me retainer, I can easily do this, but do not do this. Make sure to be very clear. If your $5,000 retainer covers two dashboards in that month and they ask for something extra, make sure they pay you for it. And make sure you set this very clear in the contract and if they ever try to go back on it you can just bring the contract up and you can terminate it if you need to listen clients sometimes aren't your friends it's amazing when they are but you cannot treat them like your friends they're your clients especially in consulting they will try to take the most out of you and pay you the least funny enough this is kind of just a random observation i've had the clients that pay you more oftentimes expect less and are less demanding as managers. Remember, you're doing freelancing, so you don't have to have a boss. So you shouldn't treat your client like a boss. You can fire your client just as much as they can fire you and you can get a new client. So don't treat it like a job. Don't think that they are your boss and have autonomy over your life and your business. Trust me, one of the biggest mistakes I see, if you're in a lot of the big IT consulting firms, is just not having airtight contracts and just clients asking for things that are out of scope or them even under delivering to some degree. So even if it's just like a simple contract, just write things down on paper, both of you sign up on it and it just makes things a lot easier, especially if they try to do some litigation later down the line. So another lesson I've learned is when you're consulting or freelancing is that you don't feel like you're learning more. When I was working at a company like tech company, I felt like I was learning from everyone around me. There are people who've been in the field for 20, 30, even 40 years as data scientists, and I was constantly learning from them. As a consultant, you're kind of brought on as expert and you have really no one to really teach you because you're the only one working there or you might have people under you and they are looking to you as a leader. So it's very different when you're joining a company and you are going to learn versus you starting your own freelancing thing. You have to kind of learn on your own, set aside your own schedule. So what I recommend people do is always enroll in a course, always enroll in a bootcamp and just continuously learn no matter what it takes because I guarantee you industry changes so fast, tools come and go. And if you're still stuck on the tool from three years ago and you're not constantly evolving, that client will find another service provider who is up to date. So you want to make sure you're attending conferences. You want to make sure you're continuously learning. It's very, very difficult once you start freelancing and consulting. So the last thing I wish I did was start networking earlier. Look, the best clients to get, especially when you're getting started, is through your network, whether it be friends of friends, old coworkers, friends of coworkers, family, with, somewhere within your network, because this is where the trust is the highest. If someone trusts you, they're more likely to even hear you out. You can send out a thousand cold emails and maybe hear back by 10 of them, but it's just a waste of energy. Why not go to someone you already know who can help you out? So a good example is this is someone in my bootcamp, a data analytics bootcamp, it was a server. And he ended up actually signing that restaurant that he worked at as a client for a data science consulting firm. So my point here is it doesn't matter where you work or what you do. If you're an IT professional, if you work at IT help desk, if you're a cook, if you're a real estate agent, I guarantee your company may not even be leveraging data right now. And you can put in an offer and be like, hey, I can manage your data. And that can be your first client. That can be your segue into starting your own business. And the last thing I've learned is that you need to be thinking like a business owner rather than an employee. When you start a freelancing gig or consulting gig, you are no longer just an employee, a nine to fiver. You are an entrepreneur. So you need to treat it like that. You need to start running a business like a business rather than just a freelance. You need to spend more time on the business than in the business. What do I mean by this? So a lot of the times turnover is a thing in consulting. Clients will maybe stay with you for maybe six months or so. It depends on how good you are a service provider. So what happens if you're also servicing 24 seven, doing the data analysis work and doing the regular day to day work, but not actively working to get new clients. Eventually you're going to work on that client. They're going to leave and you're going to be stuck with no income and need to go find another client. So my point here is you need to constantly keep building systems and constantly get the client inflow while you're also servicing them. So a good way to do this is start hiring people as soon as you get your first clients. I know it sucks, it's gonna eat into your margins, but 
If you really want to scale, you really want to take this seriously, I recommend start hiring immediately. But anyways, if you got any value in this video, please leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.